You're listening to Patch Bay on TYM KRS. Welcome to Patch Bay. So, like last week, we were talking about vinyl and stuff, and uh, yeah, I, I I'm really excited to try to do that. I was on uh, the interwebs there looking for places to to cut records into acetate plates and stuff, and then Shane went sort of uh, uh, crazy talking about tapes, which I've actually done, by the way. You've done cassettes, yeah? Yeah, tape sure. duplication and live what? performance direct-to-tape and then having to make 40 copies of it um, <laughs> within 10 minutes after to sell. Thank God for high-speed dubbing. They, they, they do that with CDs, which still amazes me. You know, I mean, you, you can you know, make MP3s or whatever during the show or make a rough mix and then, but, you know, at the end of the show, like I know you can buy Pearl Jam CDs of the show that night and it just boggles my brain that they can duplicate that many that quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, cassettes are fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun technology. Um, I don't, we didn't have time last week, but I was going to sort of bring up how the uh, the tracks work on a cassette because I don't think most people really get it. They got the, you know, side one, side two, side A, side B. Mm -hmm. um, the way that magnetic tape works, the magnetic field actually goes all the way through. Right. So it's not like you can record your signal on one side of the uh, thing. Well, yeah, no, uh, you can't. But, I mean, well, when you're, it depends on the playback medium, obviously, right? Like a regular cassette that, you would buy you, there's there's technically four tracks on the machine which is why cassette four tracks work but um you know left and right stereo on side a left and right stereo on side b mm -hmm. or your four tracks on a cassette uh like a four track cassette recorder like a Tascam or porta studio yeah so basically they have uh the the width of the tape separated into four um tracks you know four uh little strips running from beginning to end and uh the first one and the third one are for side a and the mm -hmm. second one and the fourth one are for side b and uh if you ever wondered how they actually managed to um have stereo and two sides on a tape it's uh, a trick of the physical way that things are laid out. When you take that tape out, flip it over, put it back in, you've now moved the two strips on the read head the other being way around. oriented in one way to being oriented on the other, so it's getting the other two, and that's why they interleave them. I don't know. I've always found it interesting. Uh, and that's how you can do all kinds of fun backward stuff as well. When, you, well, when you're recording on a four-track, um, because it's reading the tape, it reads the tape the same way like a 24-track tape machine would work. Uh, it's just one way. Whereas when you're talking about a stereo cassette that you'd play and listen to in your house, you have two tracks going one way, and then you flip over and you have two tracks going the other way. Um, so <clears throat> I've done that a few times, although it's entertaining to try and record to, because if you're trying to record a backwards part on the other side of the tape, um, you need to play to stuff playing backwards to you, which is, I don't Have you ever done that? <laughs> if I did, it was a very long time ago. Yeah, it's, it's entertaining. I mean, the, the cool thing is when you, when you do record the right way on the backwards side, when you flip it back over and you play it back, then you get your part backwards and everything else plays the right way. But it, it, it's tricky to... It's almost easier if you have a sampler to to play it and then sync it up. But uh, well, I don't know. It's sixty sixty of one and forty of the other, I guess. But yeah, no, that it's it's an interesting medium. This uh, the same idea with uh, twenty four track tape. There's slots for each track. You know, I've read somewhere that like to try and remove a click, guys would count. Um, you know, like, cause you, you can't see them, obviously, but they would use a, a ruler and then, you know, measure it out and then cut out, you know, sort of where the click track was prior to the start of the song, which is super engineering. Wow. There's all sorts of cool, um, interesting physical bits that one needs to know when dealing with those uh, reel-to-reel tape decks. 
like um i suppose some of these could probably apply to a cassette too but if if you uh have your mix too hot um the record head is gonna magnetize it too much mm. and it's gonna affect the tracks next to that track yeah exactly um it, well and, and i mean the thing about the thing about like 24 track tape um i worked on i've never worked on two inch recording i've transferred two inch but i worked on one inch 24 track which is quite a lot less room per track but um, you can get cross talk and bleed between tracks as well especially like you say got one that's quite hot and the next one that is you know, a little lower in volume. That was sort of the reason for compressors in the first place was to try and get make sure everything much stays level in its in its, in its in its little uh, uh, hole there. Exactly, exactly. And then, technically speaking, we don't really have use for compressors as much anymore for what they were originally intended for. Now it's an effect rather than a you know, well a necessity. <laughs> if you're if you're trying to squeeze your signal into a very specific range. It's still useful. Um, yeah. I use compressors all the time when I'm recording podcasts because we want to be able to get things up to broadcast um, audio levels. So the peaks all have to swing all the way to the top of the bit width For sure. that we have available in the digital compression. But it's a completely different animal than it was back then. Another yeah. cool one is that uh, when a tape is sitting on a reel, um, it's literally magnetized metal, you know, sandwiched between two layers of plastic. So you've, you've got this huge magnetic thing sitting there. And, uh, as the, the, the tape winds up on itself, if the magnetic field is particularly strong in a, in a spot, it can actually change the magnetic polarization of the tape above and below it in the, in the, uh, reel. So that's, I think they call that print through. That, that would be, no, print through is um, when you leave a real uh, tail in. The, what, the standard practice for, um, that might also be considered crosstalk, what you're talking about. The standard practice for when you finish with a reel is to fast forward it to the end. So that all the layers are underneath each other. Um, so if you have, like, say, a quarter-inch stereo master with 12 songs, you want to have the master, when you put it away, have it at the end of the reel rather than at the start. Because what tends to happen is if you leave it, 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 it the practice is called tails out, is the way you leave it. But if you leave it the other way, it's like tails in. You get um, ghost notes of the previous um, layer of tape. You following me? Yeah, yeah, I totally yeah. get you. So if you have a, a dead section of music, sometimes you'll hear um, like the the audio from the previous layer of tape. And we're talking like two, three hundred, four hundred feet of tape. I've had so much experience transferring like quarter inch tapes. Um, that's a whole process that I can talk about for a little bit if you want me to. Well, yeah. I mean, what? Why were you transferring? Is it just uh, moving the the um, masters and stuff over to a digital yeah. format? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the stuff that we had was from 1974. So um, when I first started working there, I had somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 um, quarter inch tapes to go through and transfer. A to double check and see if they had already been done and were on that, then transfer to that. Um, but a lot of them were not only left tails out, but they were left as what we used to call a pancake. So what they would do is they would have a, the real casing, which usually has three screws. They would take the screws off and then just leave the pancake of the reel in a box. Oh, so you needed to, you needed to like, uh, it was really tricky, tricky, but what you do is you put one of the the parts of the reel onto the pancake, then you flip it over, you take the box off, then you put the other part on, and then you screw it in very carefully, or else it will fall apart. Like you have to, it it, it requires extreme amounts of patience. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, because there's nothing holding that tape in place at that point. Yeah, nothing. How no. did they even get it into the box like that? They must Those have done the opposite. Pros. Yeah, exactly. What you do is you take off one side. You put the box back on top, and the thing is, if you look at one of those boxes, you usually have an indent of where the quarter-inch tape would sit, and and it usually still had the plastic ring that the tape was originally round around, or wound around, but um, and 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 so the the divot inside the box would fit inside that. Uh, yeah, so that was that was fun, and and then a lot of times what I would have to do. Like I, I transferred the whole lot over the course of about two or three years. Um, you'd have to like massage the tape, and <laughs> which it isn't playing very weight. But oh, oh. <laughs> what I mean, it could work. But uh, <laughs> what you late have night to, in the studio, just yeah, you exactly. and the reels, mm. coffee. And, yeah, it was it was good. Um, what you would do is you'd put on, put the reel on, put another blank reel on and you would fast forward and rewind it about eight times before you did the transfer because what would tend to happen especially the tapes would sit so long they would the tape each layer of tape would stick together and so what would happen is if you just played the darn thing it would only play for about a minute and a half and then it would stop dead which is just transferring right so you have to sort of re-energize the particles and loosen everything up a little bit Another thing that you can do when you have those types of problems is actually bake the tape. Which so, I don't. like, heat it up? Yeah. Huh. And the problem with that is you only really get one chance to do it, so I wouldn't do it unless you know somebody who can come and hang out with you who's done it before. But what I've done in the past is I think you get them warmed up to about 140 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. Um, usually build, like, a cardboard box, get a blow dryer, put about six tapes in there and warm them up and then run them. But usually only got about one chance. And then after that, they sort of tend to fall apart or start shedding and flaking and stuff. Yeah. There's guys out there whose entire life is just um, being able to save old stuff like reel to reel tapes and films and books and all that sort of thing. Yeah. I've seen uh, various documentaries on this stuff and yeah, really, Really ugly interesting work. tricks that you have to know to be able to do that kind of thing. I'm I'm gl glad that they uh, that you've been able to mess with the reel to reel stuff though. I I would really love to uh, find one and get it back up and running and working here in our studio. I have a I have a at work I have a quarter inch um, uh, Tascam machine um, that sort of semi pro that seems to have been able to do the job pretty well for me as far as transfers are concerned. Um, I actually have one here at home <laughs> that just sitting in my my uh, closet, it's an old, it's mono though, it's actually a really old, like in the box kind of unit. I'll send you a picture. Uh, maybe I can ship it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Might be fun to try. Yeah. Well, mono would be great as an effect, I think, so you can get that tape saturation thing going on. But what I would yeah. really like is like a four track. Um, yeah, with um, yeah, not uh, two stereo, but uh, an actual four track. I think that would be really fun to play with. Yeah, the the one I have is just a stereo two track, but um, there are quite a lot out there actually. Uh, it's just a matter of finding one with a, at a reasonable deal. I mean. The, the most of the sort of audio dudes out there have taken, you know, the Studers and the Ampexes and that kind of stuff. But, I mean, there's tons of, like, Tascam type ones or Yuri or um, uh, Teak. There's tons of Teak ones out there. It's just a matter of chasing one down, you know. And if somebody has, like, a, a washing machine-sized cart set up with their reels facing up and all that and they want to donate it, you know, just let me know. Yeah, we'll make that I, happen. We we will figure it out. <laughs> the UPS bill might be kind of crazy, but yeah. I'll, I will go pick <laughs> that up. Honestly, we drive all over the place a couple of times a year, and that's the sort of thing that I would definitely like be willing to drive to pick up. Because man, oh man, those are cool. Yeah, put it put it on the map. Exactly. Yeah, no, they're um, they're a lot of fun. I mean, they can be a super pain in the butt, but uh, they are a lot of fun. I was gonna say about. Um, the other thing about tape machines too is 
that um, when you're transferring them, you really have to clean the crap out of them. The, um, I've gone through boxes of uh, Q-tips and alcohol. And the thing about doing a transfer is um, usually I would clean the head, massage the tape. Some flexive tape would end up on the heads and pinch rollers and stuff like that. Clean them again before I actually did the transfer. But the thing about alcohol and tape is you have to let the alcohol dry. Because if you leave a wet alcohol and then you transfer the tape, it's going to eat away at the tape after the fact. So it was this big process of, um, you know, uh, clean it, wait 10 minutes, 15 minutes, transfer it, uh, or massage it, clean it again, wait 10 minutes. Like, it's a whole night to do, uh, you know, 20, 20 minutes of audio or 40 minutes of audio sometimes. There's really good reasons why we switched over to digital for storing these things. Really, really good reasons. Well, the, the other thing, yeah, just storage alone. I, I've had tapes that came off with, like, that had actual mold growing on the tapes that still managed to transfer, but I had flecks of green crap falling on the floor as I transferred it. <laughs> That's <laughs> it, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was a 1972 tape. Um, but, yeah, no, as far now, as... Now, did, did that add mojo to the track, or...? Yeah, there was already mojo to begin with, but I, I the yeah, boss didn't, I, I, didn't didn't take any away. The, the um the high end might have been a little suspect, but I mean at that point in time it was it on occasion it it comes down to well this is the only version of this that we have, <laughs> you know. I remember doing a transfer. Well, I did a bunch of transfers for another record company which will remain nameless but i remember them sort of giving me heck about um you know how long it took me to do a transfer and they would sort of say well we only want this song off the tape and i'd say well it's not i have to transfer the whole thing i can't fast forward in rewinding it especially that fragile is a bad idea like you've got to be splicing stuff uh especially when it starts breaking on you and like I say, it's it's 20 minutes just to clean the heads and get it prepped to transfer before you even start. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I can't even begin to think. And you had to do an entire collection. Yeah, I did. I did two skids of transfers for these guys, and so there were like four by four by four, and they're all quarter inch tapes. So you can imagine how many I did for them. <laughs> And that wasn't for the company I was working for. This was a custom thing. But as time went on, they were sort of like, well, we'd only like you to do this song or that song. But it, it doesn't speed up the process. It's the same as, well, not the same as transferring a record because you can sort of pick it. But um, it depended on who the engineer was. A lot of the stuff that I transferred that was Sunshine Records stuff, uh, there was leader tape. And, you know, so you could, you could kind of figure out where, you know, tune three was. But on a, on a, some of this other stuff, it was just tape with like you know a five second gap, and the next tune would come in. So it's it's a crapshoot to figure out where the next tune comes up, you know. So the place that you work, um, Sunshine, that's been open for how long now? They've been around since seventy four. Seventy four. So yeah. they have some serious back catalog old media stuff then. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's and and my next process is going to be the dat tapes there's um something like 400 dat tapes that i need to start shuffling through and transferring to cd which is a little easier you don't have to babysit it as much um but finding a dat machine that works well nowadays not exactly easy now um for the listeners out there who aren't familiar with it with it um dat could you just go down it real quick what is it uh digital audio tape it's the same idea as um it's 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 uh i guess the master so before when you were mixing you would be mixing off a, you know 24 track machine to quarter inch stereo um and then as time went on tape got more expensive and digital came out and everybody was excited about it so you know you you would record on 
still 24 track tape where you'd be recording on ADAT in your stereo medium instead of being a quarter inch machine would be a DAT machine. And um, you would have session DATs, mix DATs, production DATs that were the ones sent to the plant to make the CD masters or cassette masters. Um, so there was a, and basically it's the same technology as VHS. You've got, it's like a helical scanning head. It pulls the tape in and reads it really fast. The same idea as it's still tape, but it works like the way a VHS machine works. And, and it uses SVHS tapes, right? No. Uh, DAT tapes are, well, um, well, ADATs are SVHS tapes. DATs are really small. They're smaller than, uh, like, uh, video tape. Like, uh, I'm trying to think of, like, S or eight millimeter. I'm not really sure what video tapes are like, but they're smaller than like a like a DV cam. They're smaller than DV cam tapes. Gotcha. And uh, and the thing about that technology, if anybody's ever had the, had a VHS sort of break, like the tape break, and then you tape it together, it doesn't work because it's what's happening is um, there's zeros and ones being printed on the tape, not actual audio that we know, like uh, analogous waveform type audio. It, it's zeros and ones, basically. And they were 16-bit or 16-bit 44. Um, and then they made consumer DATs because for a time, all these audiophiles, they are trying to talk audiophiles into buying DATs, um, which is entertaining. But they were all at 48. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Why would audiophiles want DATs? As digital audio, wouldn't they want an analog format? They're audio files. I mean, well, no, but at the well, see, at the time, this is when CDs first came out, and the big problem with CDs was can't make a mixtape, right? The only thing you could do to make a mixtape and preserve the qual you couldn't preserve the quality at the time. You had a you know a really expensive CD player with a you know a separate expensive DA converter, but if you wanted to make a mixtape, you'd still have to make an actual mix cassette. So what the point of the the point of the consumer DATs at the time were to allow people to do an analog to analog transfer from CD to DATs. And the cool thing about DATs is you can pre-program in the start and end IDs the same as you would on a you know a really decent mastering program where you could you know have track one be able to flip it track one track two track three it, it, it has to fast forward but it's still you have the ability to do that which you can't do on a cassette next day right mm -hmm. there's that, been a lot of interesting last, formats over the years um yeah they did not last long <laughs> and, and and the well and and the trick with what they did the reason they made it 48 was because of piracy you can't do. You couldn't do a digital to digital transfer from a CD player if you had a digital out on your CD player because your DAT machine that you could buy was 48. So you'd have jitter and you'd have word clock problems and stuff like that if you tried to transfer from a CD to. You'd end up with slower audio, right? Yeah, interesting abuse of how it works to uh, make it less useful. You, you know, the whole point of like uh, beta, you know, or or like. Um, uh, you know, like DVD-Rs and stuff like that. Like, when when DVDs first came out, I can't remember how many gigs a regular DVD you would buy is, but it's more than the 4.2 you can put on a burnable one. And the reason for that was people had to... At first, you couldn't copy a DVD, right? Until you learned how to compress it. Yeah, well, yeah. I, some of us could, but yeah. Yeah, well... Now it's it's much more commonplace to be able to do it and do it well. But when they first, I'm talking about when they first came out, you know, there there was a reason that they because they made that mistake with CDs. When CDs came out, um, you could buy a blank CD that you could burn that was the same length as a regular commercial CD. If they would have made CDs, you know, 300 megs instead of 650 or 800 or whatever, you know, you would have had a well, parse possibly a few less problems, but <laughs> well, I don't know. It depends on who you are and whether or not on... you define that as a problem or not. 
Um, yeah, I'm sure in the recording industry they probably see that as kind of a problem that there was enough room to just copy a CD straight over. But I before we get away from dats, um, mm. uh, a dat and dat. What's the what's the main difference there? Is a dat later? A dat is uh, a Lesis digital audio tape, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, it was created by Alesis, which at the time was sort of the Behringer of you know the 80s and 90s. Um, not that there's anything wrong with either of those two, but <laughs> there's no subtext here no, at no. all. Well, it was really affordable at the time, but an ADAT machine was a modular eight-track digital audio recorder. Works the same idea as a, a um, uh, tape machine. Um, we have, I have four in my studio right now. They're holding the door open. Uh, uh, they recorded at 16 bit 48 K. Um, and there was, yeah. And there was eight tracks and that's where eight at optical came about. Yeah. That's uh, what I was sort of getting around to and, you know, letting, uh, you explain what it was first. So yeah, originally they were, and, and most people that I know had a 32 channel, 24 channel, usually a Mackie board, sometimes the Elisa Studio One boards. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was the same idea, same concept of recording as uh, recording a tape, but the storage medium was better. Um, it still is better as far as I'm concerned, I, I, it provided you can get an ADAT machine that still works well but the tapes are fine um and it you know it they record on svhs tapes i don't know why you couldn't use vhs tapes i'm sure there was some issue there but you actually had to format them for adas before you could record them so for a while we had i think we had eight machines and we used to have two just formatting tapes that would just sit in the corner and you just hit because rec- it, it, it format in real time so you'd have to basically hit record format and record 40 minutes of audio. I believe it was 30. Fun, yeah. Yeah. So that's so why. I... spoiled these days. So yeah. So in my studio, the only thing left uh, of that era is the the ADAT, um, uh, what do they call it, light pipe? Their, right. uh, their digital um, audio transport format, which is sort of, it runs over the same kind of uh, port and cable that you'd use for um, what is it? Spitif Optical, um, Toslink. Yeah, Toslink. Same, same idea. There's two different versions. There's a digital Toslink that's only two channel, and then there's uh, same kind of cable does eight channel, but that's the ADAT format. The original intent for that was to do digital backups, so you would get, say, you had 16 tracks audio on two different machines. You get two machines, sync them together, and then you make a digital duplicate copy of it. That was originally what they were meant for. And then some guys figured out when they got like Digio ones that they could use those as an external sync. Which is fun. Record. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's how I learned. We, we, well, part of one of the things that we would record eight channels to the old one and we record eight channels to the ADAT. And then basically um, ADAT get into the 001. So, yeah. I mean, you'd have some weird stuff, but. It would work. I've got uh, my main audio interface here um, sort of died earlier this year. Oh, God. Thankfully, um, I'm uh, friends on Twitter with uh, one of the engineers uh, at the company that made it. And uh, he said, you know, send it over. And I did. And he fixed it for me and sent it back. But I still had to be recording, you know, for those weeks. So I ended up buying a little, um, oh, what is it? Uh, phonic firefly eight channel rack mount um you know lowest common denominator sort of uh interface but it does have a uh an adat uh, light pipe port on the back and that was intriguing i thought because um i know that the uh if, if you're not using the analog circuitry in that box then it's actually a pretty decent box because you're basically just pulling it in through the ADAT and then into the firewire into the computer. So if yep. you use like a really good eight channel, eight tube pre's or something um, with an ADAT out feeding that sucker, you'd actually have a really high quality input coming into your your DAW. The only the only thing is um, the metering 
is a bit suspect. Um, when you're clipping on the ADAT, it's hot coming in digitally, like super hot. So because I've done transfers, like direct transfers with a Motu um, 8, not 896, but a Motu, yeah, 896. They have three ADAT ins and outs. So I was able to do 16 channel or 24 channel transfers from some of the old ADAT stuff, which was another thing I did was transfer a bunch of the multi-track files with some of the stuff we had. And um, there, yeah, you have to watch the metering. Like it's it's not this. Um, like you used to have to set you know like set up a console and a tape machine and make sure everything was um, you know everything was zero nominal and. So your zero on the on the channel on the on the console is the same as zero on the tape machine, um, but yeah, like they they do tend to be, at least in my experience, tend to be a little bit hotter. But yeah, no, you're right. the The ability to use them and, and it it does it's it's cool. I mean, and they sound good, you know. And if you like, you say if you're using a, you know, a decent mic pre, um, you can get some pretty killer tones out of them. Yeah, because you're you basically you've got yourself a really yeah. You, there's there's some good ADCs out there, but you're basically building your own Firewire ADC that's actually has really good pre's and a really good uh, um, uh, uh, ADCs built on to that uh, on that side of things. So you know you can put your money into one of those without having them having to put all the extra crap in there to have a USB port or Firewire or any of the feature creep sort of things that we see and uh just let the, the cheap little interface do that for you which is nice the only problem is that they're 16 bit 48 that's it there's more than one mode on them now um the newer one but uh, do, the original i don't think you can do eight on them i think you can only do four channels but you can get it up to 96 which is completely usable for everything i do no well the ridge like yeah, not not the original like the ones I'm talking about, like the original blackface eight ads are sixteen forty eight. You can't get any higher of a sampling rate off mm -hmm. Um even if I mean they have to be slaved to the word clock on whatever DAW you're using. But um and most um like a presonus Digimax kind of uh preamp they're 2448. They're not like they started making 96 ones, and then you can do the four like four channel. Like the Elises came out with that uh, HD 24, which was uh, same idea as an ADAT, but worked on a, like ID cartridge hard drives, which I always found was sort of exciting. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, yeah. So on that bad boy, you could record 24 channels at 16 bit. 48 or something, or you could record 12 channels at 2496. Uh, no, it 24, yeah, it was 24, 44, 24 channels, or 24, 96, you could only do 12. <laughs> and that might have been just the limitations of the hard drive, or maybe the transfer, I'm not really sure. But yeah, no, it, it at, that was, I think, their award winner right there, because I'm sure they're getting residuals from every company that puts an ADAT optical port on their, you know, preamp or whatever, right? Probably, yeah. But you I'm know what? We're out of mm -hmm. time. I was going to say, I was thinking that either we were out of time or we'd have to split the show. <laughs> All right, cool. So yeah, we're well, out of time officially. Well, uh, yeah, we are out of time. But um, if you guys like this sort of technical stuff of how this stuff works, let us know. We can talk more technical or we could talk more practical using this stuff. It doesn't really matter to us. I think we both do both. We both do both equally well, I think, anyway. But, yeah, no, you're right. I, it, I'm, And I'm good with flipping back and forth as well. I, I definitely want to know what other people think. That yeah. would be always a good thing. <laughs> you guys can email us at um, feedback at tymkrs.com. Or you can get on Twitter. Um, both of our Twitters are listed on the About page on PatchBay.tv, which is where you can find this show every Friday. Um, there's an RSS feed, which should be working. And uh, there, before too long, there will also be an iTunes link. We're waiting for them to add us. You know, waiting for iTunes. 
Uh, we have a whole episode eventually we could discuss eyes here. Oh, as, really? Yeah, that's uh, a that's a good one. I've actually, dealt with them a little bit with the podcasting, so I've got some gripes. I I can I can rant a little bit. Anywhere. I can also rant about them. But yeah, okay, cool. Uh well, have a good night. Yep.